All right, welcome back to the show, Money Goes on Trees podcast. My name is Lloyd Ross. This episode is titled How to Leverage Home Equity. What is home equity and how is it used? And I think a lot of people get stuck with this because it's the first time they've encountered home equity because we just went through four years of the greatest real estate boom, I think, in the history of our country here in Australia and arguably in other countries as well. I think the United States went through a fairly good run there as well when interest rates were so low. So we've got this situation where in the last four years especially, a lot of Aussies have experienced this massive growth in their home and they, for the first time, for a lot of people, anyway, they've experienced home equity and they're like, oh yeah, use my home equity. Now I can put this to work. But then they learn sometimes the hard way that home equity is not cash. This is the underlying lesson of this episode. And if you're enjoying the episode, please leave us a five-star review, share this episode. Thank you for those who have done that. Go check out the show notes, grab the book, Money Buys Happiness. Home equity is a funny thing. So when you buy a home, you generally, let's say the home's worth a million dollars. You put down 10% deposit if it's your principal place of residence, you borrow $900,000. That's your mortgage. So you've put in cash equity to acquire the home. You borrow the balance which is debt. So your capital structure of your home is 10% 10% equity, 90% debt. That's a typical scenario of a principal place of residence in Australia. Now, if you're getting a property investment, the banks typically need you to put in 20% cash deposit and borrow 80%. That's how a property investment would be structured. So what happens is you buy this place for a million bucks and then we go through this real estate boom of the last four years and all voila, you've got a million dollars. It's maybe doubled in value, which is wild. Usually it takes about 12 years for property to double in value, but you would have timed it well if you bought in 2020. And then, you know, you've got a million dollars next day. Let's say your house is worth $2 million. I'm trying to keep these numbers simple for you. And so you've got a million dollars in equity, right? You're like, whoa, I only owe the bank 800 or, you know, 900,000. My home's now worth two million. I'm a millionaire. I have net assets of a million dollars. I don't feel like a millionaire though, because I'm still at my nine to five job and I have no spare cash flow and I don't feel like a millionaire, but I am one. There's another episode I did called House Poor. Go check it out. Um, and so you're like, well, all this money is in the value of my real estate because I bought it and I held it and it's gone up. So now how do I access that? Like maybe I can use the home equity to go invest in shares. Maybe I can use the home equity to go buy another property. So your mind starts to think about all these things it can do. The fatal mistake is thinking that home equity is cash. It, uh, it is only cash when you sell. So if you were to sell the property for $2 million and pay back the bank, the eight hundred or nine hundred thousand dollar loan that you initially started with then you're left with the cash equity from the deal right so you're actually left with cash that is cash and so you could actually sell the place buy another place downgrade have no debt that'd be pretty intelligent but of course we don't want to do that they want to upgrade I'm not a downgrade, they want to upgrade. I want a bigger house. But let's say you wanted to just use some of that equity to invest and grow your portfolio. So you go to the bank and say, Mr. Bank, Mr. Broker, whoever you're talking to, I know that I'm sitting on all this equity and it's not working for me because in my house where I'm living, I cannot rent out the rooms. Our family's in here and we want to put this money to work somehow. Now, by the way, your equity is already working because it's invested in real estate. <laughs> so it's already working for you already. You don't need to get it out and work it somewhere else. But if you want to engage more leverage, uh, which is what this is all about, well, which is what people do, then you can do this. Go to the bank, you say, hey, bank, um, please lend me against my equity. So lend me money and, and take my equity as security. Because the bank knows you can always sell your house and get the cash back. So it knows that. So it'll help, it'll let you borrow against the equity. Generally, a bank will, will lend 80% of the equity. So let's say, for example, you got a million in equity. The bank will lend you 800,000. Now, you don't need 800,000. What you can do is you can say, well, Mr. Bank, you can uh, please lend me $200,000 against my home equity. I've got a million in equity. Let me borrow 200,000 and let me go and put that as a deposit for a property investment. So you go, you find a property investment for a million, you borrow 200,000 against your home equity. So that's a borrowing. You put the deposit down, the property investment, then you got to borrow the 80, 80%, buy that place. So you're borrowing the other 80%. So you're effectively borrowing 100% of the property investment because your equities are borrowing and the balance to complete the purchase is a borrowing. And then because it's 100% borrowing, you're paying 6% or 6.5% interest on that. So it's about 65,000 a year in interest costs and the rent is only 4.5%. So you're actually negative 2.5%. Then you realize you've got to actually pay the rates, the insurance and the upkeep as well. And this is where people get in a little bit of strife. They don't have enough cash flow in their family household to service those extra costs that they thought coming in. Now the bank will actually do a serviceability test and make sure you can, but sometimes someone loses a job. Sometimes, you know, it's not always what you think it to be in terms of the rent and so forth. And you can get a bit of strife. If you're already in a very tricky financial spot, you're not managing your cash flow, doing that, engaging more leverage, buying another property with more costs can put you in a position of financial crisis. Okay. So the time to do that would be when you A, have lots of equity, B, have fairly low debt on your principal place of residence, have enough cash flow coming into the family, be able to actually leverage your equity, buy the next property and do it comfortably. Then it makes sense, okay? Because you want to engage more leverage, but do it safely and effectively. Lots of friends have done that and made millions of dollars. 
great. But if you are someone who has struggled financially for a lot of your life and you've now got this new equity, you're like, oh my God, yeah, I'm gonna just be aware that when you go and engage and buy another property, you're fully financing it. You're 100% financing it. And the rental yield, because rates are so high, right? The retail rate's probably 6.5%. You're not gonna be able to service it on a 4.5% yield or a 5% yield. You're gonna be a negative geared property, just so you know. But if you know that and you can service it, it's only gonna cost you an extra 100 bucks a week or 200 bucks a week to service that. And you know the value of the property investment's gonna grow by maybe 8% a year. And you go, you know what? We can lose a couple percent. We're going to get six. We're going to compound our wealth. Makes sense. If you are if you understand those details and you've done the feasibility study and you actually know the exact details and you know what you're getting into, that makes a lot of sense to grow your portfolio and grow your wealth. It does. You grow through property. But if you don't know those things, you haven't done that homework and you're looking for a way to just put your equity to work and you have really no idea how you're going to do it, you're going to buy up the property and you accumulate properties and they've got a lot of leverage on them. All you're really accumulating is a lot of debt. And you need a long runway and you need to do this properly for it to work. And it's okay if you don't do it. Like it's okay to have all this equity and have a mortgage and pay mortgage and just leave it. That's okay too. Your equity is still working because it's actually in a property which will continue to grow in value if it's in the right location, in the right country and so forth. Not all property grows because in Japan, property's gone down since 1992. Be aware of that too. But for most part, in, in, in most Western countries, property tends to grow with the population growth, which is great. So you can grow property using your equity, but do it sensibly is the lesson. That's the underlying message I want to give you in this show. I was talking to someone, one of my students, and said, you know, thinking about home equity and this and that. I said, you know that equity's all cash, right? And it's like, oh, shivers. And it feels like it is, but it's not. The bank will lend you cash against the equity security, but the actual, you're borrowing money. So just be aware. If you're kind of going through this process where you're like, well, maybe I should do it, then a maybe is probably no. Like it's okay not to go and blast your wealth up and compromise your happiness. That's what I talk about in my book. Optimize your life for happiness, not money. It's what I've done my whole life. I've optimized for happiness and money because we I could be we could be a lot wealthier. If we engage a lot of leverage earlier in our life, we could be a lot wealthier. No doubt about it. We could be probably another two or three or four million in net worth. I don't know. But for one second, I'm not going to compromise my happiness. Other friends of me have said, Wait, how come you didn't get into the commercial real estate? So you would have made millions. I'm like, it's because I optimized my life for happiness, not money. And that's why I've built this life of financial independence. And I get to do this and live my ideal life because I'm not optimized for money. I tried to do that earlier in my career, optimized for money, did not work. I didn't like it, wasn't happy. And if I'm like not happy, I shift and change my life. Bang, because we're only here one time. So the whole idea is not to accumulate houses and debt if it's going to make you unhappy. But do it sensibly. If it makes sense, you understand the details, you understand the finances, and you know what you're doing. Then go for it, right? Leverage up and go. But if it compromises one night of sleep, of poor sleep, probably not worth it. So there are other ways to make money outside accumulating properties. But of course, it can be done well, and you can make a ton of money and do it sensibly and get a win-win outcome from it, which is what I would, would love for you if you did it. But I guess the, this episode is really just about explaining what it is, how it works, how you can leverage it or not, depending on your current situation. All right, so uh, if you've enjoyed the episode, please share it. Leave us a five-star review. Go to lowestelegram.com for free money tips on the daily. And uh, thanks for those who have listed us a five-star review. Appreciate you. Send this episode to friends. Share this in your stories and tag me in it. I'll reshare it. And of course, um, look forward to talking with you and seeing you uh, on the next episode of the Money Grows on Treaties podcast.